So, some population case studies. Firstly, let's look at some problems caused by overpopulation. So, case studies are always worth seven points, so you should always try to get um, three full points with explanations, but if you can do more than that, then that's even better. So, if it asks you for problems caused by overpopulation, in the case studies, you will say Bangladesh. And then you say, there will be traffic congestion, which is basically when there are too many vehicles, so cars, on the roads in cities like Dhaka, and you need to use these place-specific references because they give you extra points. So, traffic congestion in cities like Dhaka. Remember, it kind of like Drake, except not really, but D-H-A-K-A, Dhaka. Also, the overuse of agricultural land on floodplains of the Ganges. This leads to loss of soil fertility. So here, look at this picture. These are the floodplains of the Ganges. Okay, another place-specific reference. The floodplains of the Ganges. Since people use the land way too much for agriculture, so they farm on it a lot too often, well, the soil becomes less fertile. So a nicer way of saying that, loss of soil fertility because of overuse of agricultural land on floodplains of Ganges. Okay, widespread deforestation for firewood on slopes of Himalayas. So, in Bangladesh, there are also the Himalayas, and people do cut down trees to get firewood, so they can burn the fire and make heat or cook something or stuff like that. So, widespread deforestation for firewood on slopes of Himalayas. Then, some just extra ones, lack of work, because there are too many people, because there aren't enough jobs, so there will be unemployment, which will lead to poverty. There will be inadequate food supply, so that will lead to malnutrition. There will be bad access to education, so people will remain unqualified. There will be poor access to health care, and therefore high death rates. Um, also, overcrowded housing with inadequate basic amenities. So, yeah. Now, let's look at international migration with pull and push factors. Turkey to Germany. That's international migration. Well, some push factors would be that in Turkey, there are few manufacturing jobs because it's largely dependent on agriculture. So Turkey as a whole does a lot of farming, agriculture, and it does not do a lot of manufacturing. So therefore, there are not many manufacturing jobs available. So those are some push factors in case you want to get a job in the manufacturing business. Also, the farmland is unproductive. It's inefficient due to poor agricultural techniques. They haven't, they're not like super modern, so they're not using tractors and stuff. They're doing it all by hand or something, and it's just not effective. It's not efficient. So poor agricultural techniques lead to unproductive farmland. Also, in places like central Anatolia, do remember this word, Anatolia, it's a place-specific reference. Think of it like Antonia, except it's Anatolia. <laughs> ah, la, la. So there, there may be drought, so really not a lot of water. This will dry out everything. That's not a nice thing, drought. So drought in places like central Anatolia. And also another push factor, so another reason why they want to leave Turkey, it's because refugees that live near the border of Iraq, because Iraq and Turkey are next to each other, so obviously there's the border. Well, with all the war and stuff going on within Iraq, refugees fear for their lives. So people that live in Turkey, on the border of Iraq, they're very scared for their lives, so they want to leave. And Germany is obviously a nice and safe place. So what were some pull factors? Well, back in, you know, the 1940s, um, well late 1940s, after World War II, well, cities in Germany were completely destroyed. So, for instance, take a look at this picture. Here, that's a picture of Dresden, and it's totally destroyed. So, there are many jobs available there to rebuild cities like Dresden after um, World War II. So, that's lots of job opportunities. Also, a greater, they would have greater access to schools and, ho and hospitals in cities like Berlin or Frankfurt rather than in rural Turkey. Turkey, So, you know, better schools and hospitals than in rural Turkey. Also, they can buy food from shops rather than um, plant them themselves, so that would make it more reliable. Now, governmental policies to influence population growth. 
Let's look at the China's um, one child policy. This is not how it's work, but just to describe it, like what are some things they do? Well, couples who had one child received rewards and welfare benefits. So if you only had one son or one daughter, you would um, get a reward, like, I don't know, a free trip or something. Or welfare benefits, you pay less tax or something. Um, yeah, or your child may, yeah, just benefits like that. And People who had more than one child were fined, so they had to pay money. And there were also reports of forced abortions and sterilization. So the government forced people to abort their children. So while they're in the womb to just kill it. So, yeah. And also there were reports of sterilization, like what you do to animals so that they can't get kids. Well, you can do the same to people. And there were reports of this. Because if people kept getting children, you would be sterilized. <laughs> that sounds so crazy. Okay, incent they would also have incentives to build one-child families, like free places in schools and healthcare. If you had another one, this is another um, incentive to get only one child. Well, they would, um, yeah, you would get, uh, your son or daughter would get a free place in school and free healthcare if he was an only child or she. Then, another way they managed to enforce their um, policy was that they had workplace snoopers. So in every kind of company or workplace, they would also always have one person who needed to um, give permission to their employees to have children. So it's all, you know, on the book. The government is always aware of who's having children, who's not. So... Yeah. Also, the government would advertise the benefits, so the advantages of small families. For instance, they would say, if you have only one child, you have more money that you can spend. So this is called, in the geographical term, greater amount of disposable income. Since they don't have two children, where they would have to pay twice as much, they only have one, they have a lot more money left that they can spend on going to holiday or something like that. Woo! Then, you'd also have Granny Woo which was kind of, think of it like Hitler's secret police. There was kind of like that, except obviously less um, violent. But and they were called the Granny Wu, who were um, responsible for checking that women were um, practicing contraception and to report pregnancies to the government. So in every building and stuff like that, you would always have like the tenant or something. The, I don't even know what it's called. It's called Lord... Oh, that's going to bother me so much. What's that word called? In case you know, can you just comment it? <laughs> it's like when it, when you live in an apartment or something, the guy who's renting it to you, he's your lord or something. Oh, my God. Lord. Land. I just don't know. <laughs> Whatever. WhatsApp me if you can remember it, guys. Okay. Um, yeah, so these people, the Granny Woos, were responsible to check that everyone was using contraception and to report any pregnancies. So now let's look at the impact of this policy. This is a separate case study, it's on the same topic, but be careful to read the question properly. So the impact of this population, well, firstly, there was a much greater need for care homes because children were, um, there would be less children but the population that's already there keeps getting older, so there's an aging population, and these people do need care homes. So an impact of it was that there was a much greater need for care homes for old people. Also, and even just for young ones. Well, no. Forget I just said that. That's so dumb. No, there was not a need for young people to have care homes. Just for the old ones. Also, another impact was that a lot of girls were abandoned. For instance, if you um, were, you know, a family... A, wife and a husband and you got a kid and then you gave birth and it's a girl um you were it's very likely that you would kill it or leave it somewhere because you didn't want a girl as your only child you'd rather have a guy who can really work and do manual labor and make money for the family or something like that and yeah so a lot of girls were abandoned also it was uh, it's estimated that men will outnumber girls by 2020 remember it's 2020 
So there will be more men in China than there will be women. So this will lead to social tension or unrest because, you know, the girls will be extremely, well, not competitive, but the guys will. No, wait. Guy, men will. No, forget that. Yeah, no. Don't forget that. The, there are not many girls, there are many guys. So the guys will be competitive. Okay, because they know that at the end of the day, not every single guy will be able to have a Chinese wife. Because it's just not statistically possible. Okay, by 2025, China is expected to have more elderly people than children. Okay, by 2025, China will probably have more, like, grandpas and shit than they will have children. So, new point. Also, people fear that China's ever-growing economy will not have enough workers to keep it from expanding. So, they'll kind of be stagnant to some extent. Also, the policy has reduced the fertility rate by 50%. So the number that of children that women um, get been reduced by 50%. Another impact of these um, of this governmental policy is that the danger of epidemic spreading was obviously reduced since there are less um, people. So yeah. Also, if the mom has it, then she won't give it to all her kids or something. Because she'll only have one kid. Then, for this place-specific reference, you will say, In Shanghai, people are encouraged to have two children if they're both single children. It doesn't really answer the question, but it doesn't matter, as long as there's a space-specific reference. But at the same time, you can just say, Much greater need for care homes in Shanghai. It really doesn't matter. Okay. Now, a government that is worried about its rapid population growth would be Bangladesh. We've kind of already done this case study, but it's another way of wording the question. So we'll just redo it, plus it'll be good revision. So what government is worried about its population growth? Bangladesh. Because there are so many people, and it's happening so quick, that there's not enough jobs, so there'll be poverty, which will lead to crime and death. Also, many people will be living on streets in cities like Dhaka, um, there will also be inadequate food supplies, so there will be starvation. There will be poor access to health care and education. There will be traffic congestion. And there will be the overuse of agricultural land on floodplains of Ganges, which will lead to loss of soil fertility. Also, widespread deforestation for firewood on stones of rural land along... Yeah, of rural land. Or on slopes of Himalayas. Go with that one, it's easier. Okay, some LEDC example of a rural to urban migration. Some push and pull factors. Basically, rural to urban, it's within the same country. It's when you go from the countryside to an urban area, so a city. We're going to look at Catinga to Rio, which is in Brazil. So, some push factors. Farmland in Catinga, the place in the countryside, is unproductive because of the droughts. There are often droughts, so it's very dry and the farming is unproductive. Also, the people living in Katinga, so in the countryside, lost the best quality land, so the land that is most um, suited to have your agricultural crops on it. Well, they lost it. Well, the land was right next to the San Francisco River. Think of it like San Francisco, except that Sao Francisco, like in Sao Paulo. Yeah, so the best agricultural land was by that river, but they lost it when reservoirs were built, okay? Reservoirs were built, so they lost best quality agricultural land by San Francisco River. Those are our push factors. I mean, pull. F yeah, push factors. Now, here are some pull factors. People realized that they could make more money in the informal sector by offering shoe shine services in places like the Copacabana Beach or the Ipanema Beach, two really famous beaches in Rio. Here you can see a guy in Brazil shoe shining. So, yeah. Also, Rio offers people hope. For, for instance, in the countryside, to go to Rio is like super great and cool because they have hope there because the houses there are made of basic concrete. And they have piped water, so running water and sewage pipes, which is a luxury to people in Katinga. Also, people in the um, Rockin Rochina, I don't even know how to pronounce that, Rochina favelas have better access to primary health care than 
the people in the countryside do. So that's another incentive, a, a pull factor. Okay, now let's look at impact of HIV AIDS on the population and the economy. Botswana is going to be our case study because it's in Africa in case you didn't know, but you probably should know that. And if you didn't, then I just hope you get an F on your exam, but that's that one's for you, Sherry. <laughs> Uh, okay, so the impact of HIV AIDS on population and its economy. Well, in Botswana, 5,800 people died from HIV AIDS in 2010. And so that's obviously of an effect on the population, an impact. Then on the economy, let's look at the econo economical effect. Well, the antiretroviral drug program, so what is needed to kind of ease the symptoms and stuff to can not cure not to cure HIV AIDS there's no cure but you can treat it to some extent and you do this with antiretroviral drugs so this program is very very expensive and if you want to have doctors cuz well obviously there won't be very many doctors that are but from Botswana so you'll need to bring in doctors from outside of the country and to do that, you'll need to make the wages high because who else would want to go to a country that's full of HIV and AIDS? Well, for money. So they need to raise the wages, which is harmful for the economy. Also, a lot of people were ill slash are ill, so they can't work. So they are not contributing to the economy because they're not working. Also, there are severe reductions in health of individual families since people are not working anymore, which means that there is less money for health care and education. So education levels um, fall. Also, many AIDS orphans exist in Botswana, so kids who lost their parents to AIDS. And there are not enough care workers nor the money to provide help for all of them. And also, many are caring for siblings and don't have time or money for school. Also, here comes this place-specific reference. The incidence of HIV, so the how many people have it in HIV, so the occurrence of HIV was very, very high in mining towns like Silive Fixe. Think of it as saliva and then a kind of Asian way to say F-U. Fixe. <laughs> Not really, but you know. Saliva, fix it. Saliva, fix it. Where 52% of the population was HIV positive in 2003. So. Distribution of a country. Niger. Let's look at Niger. As you can see here, the north does not have a river, but the south does. And. Yeah! Sorry. <laughs> My mom, um, the south has a river, so it has more water than the north. So in the north, there is a lack of domestic water supply. People don't have a lot of water. So um, there will obviously be less people. The valley of the river Niger is densely populated as it's an attractive area to settlement since it offers the best land, not only because it has water, but also for farming. It's very, very fertile land. So here along this river, along the river Niger, there are heavy, densely populated settlements. Also, another reason why um, the south is more populated is that um, there are better. there's an airport at Bamako, Bamako, which is our place-specific reference. So there's an airport at Bamako, so people are obviously going to stay in the south. Because they will be closer to an airport, which is always something important. So it's densely populated in the south because of the airport, the valley of River Niger, and because there's just generally more water. Also, the southern parts are closer to boundaries of more countries, like Ivory Coast. So more trade opportunities. Because, wait, let me try and move it here. Look here, in the north, you're next to the, like, if you're here... You're next to just kind of in the region, you've got Algeria and Libya. But if you're here, you've got Mali, Burka, whatever, Burk, Burka, Benin, Nigeria, and here you've got the Ivory Coast. So you're generally more, you have more countries, so more trade opportunities. Okay, now let's look at a country with a high birth rate. 
and a uh, birth rate. Birth rate and why? Well, let's look at Swaziland, which is again in Africa. There are always very large families, as you can tell by this picture. A reason why a country has a high birth rate, especially Swaziland, is because people get a lot of kids so that they can send out their kids to work for money. Because they're not very rich, so they need more money. So the more kids, the more money. So they send out kids to work for money in towns like Mbabane. So you should know this place. It's your place-specific reference. Mbaban. Think of bana banana, but kind of babane with an M at the front. M banana. M Mbabane. <laughs> I'm just trying to make it easy for you. I don't know. Okay. So another reason that there may be high birth rights rates, I can't even pronounce that right now, is because contraception isn't readily available in rural areas. Perhaps there's just none there, or it's too expensive, or they don't know about it, but there is just not availability of contraception. Another reason that people get a lot of kids is because men are considered of higher status if they have more kids. So the more kids you have, the cooler you are, like in the African culture. It's kind of weird, but yep. Also, in some places, well, in Swaziland, polygamy is allowed. This means that you can have more than one wife or something. For instance, the king of Swaziland had more than 70 wives and had more than 240 children. Can you believe it? Also, some religions, especially in Swaziland, are against abortion. So, yeah. Now, let's look at some problems caused by the increase in population of over... 65 years old. Well, in Japan, which is our case study, over 20% of the population is elderly dependents, so people over the years of 65. Um, because there is over 20% of the population is over 65, it causes a strain on the government because um, they need to... Hold on a second... Yeah, because they need to spend, they need more money to be spent on care homes. But since there are so many old people and not that many working people, they don't have a lot of money because they're spending more money than they're getting from taxes because there are more people than there are people working. So they need to increase the taxes to fund pensions and stuff like that. And that's not a good thing because that's a problem for workers because they need to pay more tax. And also... Since their population is just so old, there's a lack of innovative workforce. So think innovative as in creative. People aren't as creative anymore. So there's a stagnation on electronic industry. For instance, think of your grandparents. They're really not really probably not good with um, technology. Whereas you are and you can think of new technology things all the time and you're creative and stuff. Whereas they probably are more traditional. So that leads to... Um, lack of innovative workforce so a stagnation on electronic industry stagnation means kind of a hold a stop also there's not enough recruitment for defensive forces there aren't many people well younger people to recruit for the army so obviously the defense of a country will not be that good also there will there won't be many workers so there'll be a lot of um jobs so there is lack of workers because there are more jobs and there are people working. So you need to attract foreign workers, such as Chinese workers or Filipino workers. So um, since there are, like we said, the reduced supply of workers, it will lead to large MNCs, which means multinational corporations like Sony, having to increase the wages, which is not really a good thing for them. Also, many underused services such as schools and stuff like that and daycares must be closed because there simply are not enough people. The th threshold population is just not there. 